Since the tabloid National Enquirer did a hatchet job in its usual style, trying to paint cattlemen as greedy, not only has the NFO replied, but it's gratifying to know that a large segment of the more responsible journalists, both the press and the broadcasters, have turned to in replying to the Enquirer. In the week after this reporter, Phil Allen, was misquoted, along with economists from two different universities, we received phone calls from the following asking us to help set the record straight about cattle prices. The CBC out of Toronto, two 50,000-watt clear channel stations, WHO Des Moines and WCCO Minneapolis, the Lincoln Star, uh, the Denver Record Stockman, Channel 7, Omaha, the Des Moines Register, a network of Kansas stations out of Wichita, the Sioux Falls Argus Leader, a Fargo, North Dakota TV station, and a North Platte, Nebraska newspaper. Uh, we also replied on two programs back-to-back -back on our coast-to-coast -coast syndication of Here's Info, and we fed news actualities to 14 regional agricultural network groups. And now here's a highlight from our series Here's Info, which went coast to coast. When the tabloid paper National Enquirer interviewed me as spokesman for the NFO, along with several other people about beef prices, they put our statements into a story accusing American cattlemen of greed in cutting back on their herds to jack up the price. I had explained to their reporter the NFO's successful cull cattle bargaining program, but they left out a very important part of the story, I told their reporter, which would have completely altered the tone of their article if they had printed it. I said and expressed it in several different ways that when cattlemen are in the process of reducing their herds, part of the long existing cattle cycle, when they're reducing their herds, their price situation is such that they have a real question whether feeding out a calf will pay any profit. In other words, they reduce their herds when prices are too low. Here's Walter Hackney, head of NFO Livestock Operations, clarifying the position of American cattlemen following an article in the tabloid National Enquirer accusing them of greed in reducing their herds to jack up the price. From the year ending 1973 through probably the middle of 1977, the cattle industry lost in excess of $10 billion. Now, for an article to come out strictly consumer-oriented that would blame the American cattlemen to try to recoup those kind of losses and make a claim that they had made $4 billion back, to me, is more erroneous than anything they may have misquoted in that article. As to why the American cattlemen reduced their herds, no, it had nothing to do with greed. The American cattleman did get together, granted, but he was brought together by his bankers. The bankers told him, you're out of business. You have lost all of your working capital due to these drastic losses in those years I've just commented about. You either reduce your herd to a manageable amount or you sell the remaining of those herds out and get out of the business. That's the position that the American cattleman found himself in beginning 1978. Walt, what about this kind of coverage of the beef price situation, such as the National Enquirer article? For this newspaper to come out and one so misinformed that they didn't understand the words being said to them, but also, more importantly, flagrantly, flagrantly misquote you and whoever else in the context that the American consumer is all of a sudden alienated, again, the very people that feed them, I think is asinine. Corning, Iowa, the rural community where the National Farmers Organization has its home office, had a star attraction this year for its May festival. Devon Woodland, the new president of the NFO, having just returned from a U.S. trade mission to China, was invited by the Chamber of Commerce to address the beef and pork barbecue the first public address after he returned from China. He was asked who all made up the American trade delegation. The people that we were with was a very prestigious group. The president of NBC was there, the uh, executive vice president of DuPont, IBM, uh, Marineland Midland Bank out of New York, uh, Orida Foods, uh, the American Potato Company. There were 22 in our group, including the wives.
And so it was a very prestigious group, and uh, NFO was the only agriculture uh, representation within that group of people. You recall Devon Woodland mentioned that he was the only farm organization representative on this particular trade mission. Here he tells how he functioned. I talked to him one-on-one. -on -one. We didn't do it in a group. Uh, I requested that we do it one-on-one -on -one and that uh, we not be in a group. And hence, I could tell them that the major grain companies were taking advantage of them, and they were taking advantage of us, and there was one way to correct it, and that's for us to deal direct. And they understood that and nodded their head and, and, uh, and smiled, and the reaction is the only way you could really read them. He also told the banquet crowd in comparing Chinese agriculture to ours that the two countries are similar in geographic size, that the Chinese farm 7% of their land compared to our 23%, that they feed nearly 900 million people, we feed roughly 200 million. The best way to find out, really, how a farm collective bargaining program works is to talk to the people who use it. First, here's Merle Sunken, who supervises the volume of hogs going through the NFO collection points. He'll explain the difference between an NFO point and, say, a packer buying station or a sale barn. Merle? Phil, we have highly trained industry professional negotiators that do all the marketing and bargaining for our programs. And of course, we have the same as the rest of the industry. We have the carcass uh, grade and weight marketing. We have live weight merit programs. We have a blend of a one to three program. But I think something that's very unique in our system is that we first off, we have day ahead pricing. The hogs are priced today and just shipped to the collection points tomorrow. Uh, we have direct shipments where the packers in most cases are picking up the trucking freight from the producer's yards to the packing plant or in this manner. We have forward contracting that guarantees a fixed price at a definite delivery time with no margin calls and no margin cost to the producer. We have assured checks uh, which protects the producer against any packer losses. Thanks, Merle. Now let's hear from some of your members who participate in collective bargaining in hogs. First, Robert Bressler, who's Farrell to finish operation, is near Bird City, Kansas. He sends his hogs to the NFO collection point at McDonald, Kansas, near the Nebraska line. That NFO point has increased its volume almost 70% in the last year. Robert Bressler. Since we've been marketing, our price has averaged uh, just shy of 50, well, it's 59 cents a hundred weight above the Omaha markets since we've been uh, going to the NFO. We have never marketed uh, pigs anywhere but the Next, we hear from Dave Goodnature of Sow Enterprises, which is located near Geneva, Minnesota. About half the production is breeding stock, and half are marketed with NFO's program at Albert Lee. We've participated in this program for two years and seem to be well pleased with working with NFO and selling directly to Wilson and Company. My father participated in NFO about 20 years ago. I've always had the philosophy, if farmers stick together, we'll get our price. And now let's hear from Howard Baker, who farms near Dayton, Ohio, about 30 miles north of there. He raises corn, soybeans, wheat, and tobacco. His hog operation has a capacity of about 1,800. We get the right weight, and there's just no quivering around about the price or anything else. We just like to do it that way. Members of the NFO who participate in their hog programs. Merle Sunken, volume supervisor for NFO collection points, noted some unique features such as day ahead pricing, direct ship, and guaranteed checks. Now we hear Ed Graff, director of the dairy department. He talks about an important subject, young people taking over leadership in the National Farmers Organization. The National Farmers Organization has to get young people involved we're asking them to come in and in all sincerity telling them to take leadership roles make this thing work for you explain it and say here it is now take it and use it it was built for you well ed do you feel hopeful about young people taking over leadership in the nfo what's the track record so far i certainly do feel hopeful and i can cite you the names of young people in leadership roles all across the country for instance in fond du lac county wisconsin 
Jerry Birschbach was elected county president this year. In fact, that whole county NFO is uh, being run by young people. In McPherson County, South Dakota, there's a new county president, Gary Shipley, who came out of school teaching and coaching. He was also a school principal before he returned to farming in his own county and promptly got elected to McPherson County NFO president. In Kansas, Gary Glasgow is a newly elected president of Cheyenne County NFO. Glasgow is a Kansas uh, star farmer in his FFA days. There are several young women who have been elected county NFO presidents also. Lee Schultz of Scotland County, Missouri. She helps write and produce NFO and family farm spot announcements for radio and TV in that area, just below the Iowa line in the Show Me State. And then there's Donna Stout in Washington County, Idaho. She's a newly elected president. Mrs. Vernon Summer in pre is president of Route County, Colorado, NFO. And so it goes. That's Ed Graff, director of the Dairy Department of the National Farmers Organization. For a grain department report, we hear Jack Cruz. Of course, the river traffic is really active at this season, and Jack talks about that. After all, he's in barges. But he also has a rundown on some volume gains for the NFO in various parts of the United States. Jack? Grain is on the move. Barges are loading for the National Farmers Organization on the Ohio, Mississippi, and Cumberland Rivers. Rail cars are really flying. This past month, Montana shipped 198 cars of wheat alone. Weekly sales volume of grain has reflected a steady increase. In fact, last Wednesday, we sold more grain in one day than the entire previous week. These were combined sales from all areas. This past week, we also have received two inquiries from foreign countries for huge quantities of grain. We need more grain signed up on contract for sale. You know, it's a little late to load your gun after the panda bears are gone. Sioux Falls marketing area of South Dakota has over 80,000 acres of grain signed for harvest of 79, and they are still signing up grain right now. Farmers really have power if they only realized it. Barge freight has fallen out of bed. All the farmers have been in the fields for the past 30 days, and the river, river terminals have shipped all their grain. There are empty barges all over with nothing to put in them. Freight rates at Davenport, Iowa, fell from 275% of tariff to 190% in less than a week. They just can't get the grain if the farmers don't sell it or don't deliver it. That's real economic power. You've heard another monthly tape service to the counties, compiled and edited by Don Mack, head of the NFO Radio Division. I'm Phil Allen for NFO News. And that for today is something to think about.